So first of all, uh, I can't see anybody. So Pete, wherever you are, uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and the rest of the CMO Club present. This is my first CMO Club, and I'm really very honored. Having never been here before, I didn't realize what a high quality of attendees it is, what a great session. So I, in case I don't screw up the session, I hope to be invited back. Um, in fact, I was particularly thinking a lot about the theme for this week. The theme for this week was, and is, innovation and inspiration. In a very real sense, I think you've captured in two words the future of marketing. Now, I know that innovation in particular, and maybe also inspiration, have turned into a little bit of buzzwords. If you Google innovation, I'm sure you'll get a couple of million hits. And in some sense, I think us marketers, it's time for us to take that word back. A lot of development organizations, a lot of service organizations now throw out the word innovation all the time regardless of whether innovation or not. And I think that's the heart of what we are and what we as marketers need to do. To me, innovation is all about change. And the watchword I use a lot inside of SAP, not just for the marketing organization, but for SAP overall, and yes, sexy and proud, definitely that's what it stands for, is that what got us here won't get us where we need to go. And if we don't embrace innovation, I think there is no future for marketing at all. So if innovation is one pillar, if it's the yin, then inspiration is the yang. And to me, inspiration is about dreaming. Maybe dreaming the impossible dream. I know growing up in a high school class of only 13, I'm a little bit of a Don Quixote tilting at windmills. But I think inspiration is the other heart about what we do. We need to inspire internally, and we need to inspire externally. So as I think about the future, the future of marketing and the journey we're all on, when we started to put together this presentation, Krista, who's somewhere in the back of the room, showed me this image and she said, this should be your hook. And I looked at it and I said, what are you, crazy? There's nothing future listening like this. I said the title of this talk was Journey to the Future. This is, this is not future oriented. So I'm standing up on stage and saying, I was wrong. I thought about this, Krista, you're absolutely right. This is a perfect image for where I think we are as a marketing discipline. We know we're headed into the distance we see the road underneath our feet and in front of us, but it's certainly not a paved road. It's quite bumpy. Sometimes there's quite large potholes. We therefore drive relatively slowly and probably not as fast as we want. We can't see the destination we're headed to. And in a very real sense, we don't know what happens just beyond the horizon. It feels sometimes that there's a cliff there that we're gonna fall off of. And the only reason that I'm even here talking about the potential future that we're nervous is nobody really knows. So I'll give you some hints as to what I think the future actually looks like. But the key is, as a discipline, marketers are nervous. We're nervous because we're at this road. And I will, I promised that I would not actually do the Robert Frost poem, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood, but it feels like that's where we actually are. So I tend to get some time, I fly entirely too much, about 80% of the time, and so on plane times, I do my best thinking if it's not actually on hikes. And I've asked myself a lot, why are we so nervous? Why are we even asking the question, what's the future of marketing? And it occurs to me the answer is both simple and somewhat complex. The answer is because as we got closer to the business, we're suffering from the same challenges that our businesses are. Now everyone's got their favorite phrases as about how fast the world is changing. And I'm not gonna read all these to you. As marketers, you probably have some of these in your slide decks and your presentation as well. You may talk about information doubling 18 months. You may talk about the rise of the new middle class and five billion people buying things they didn't buy before. I'll tell you the one number I track the most is mobile. Two years ago when I talked to people on stages like this, I said there are more mobile devices than there are televisions. And that got us all to think about what does it mean when the mobile device is our television, which it's almost there now. Last year when I gave the talk, I said, you know what, there are actually more mobile devices than toothbrushes. Turns out we passed the, the four billion mark on mobile devices. This year, sometime about now, there are now more mobile devices than there are people on the planet, about eight billion. If we continue on this trend, and everybody seems to think that we will, in two years, there will be more mobile devices than shoes. That means about 30 billion. Now, I myself have four of them in my laptop bag, so, I'm well above that average of 3.1 that people are predicting in two years. So why is that an interesting fact? 
because I think our businesses and therefore our marketing is fundamentally under attack. Because we built everything we did as businesses and how we think about marketing, assuming that resources were free, abundant resources, spend as much as you want on an ad, build as much as you want, open a new center, we have to switch our mindset to scarce resources and the concept of optimization has to be forefront of everything we do. Less is the new more. Or maybe since I'm in New York, I should say less is the new black. The second thing is we all know there's lots of information and everybody has access to it. I think information is the new oil. Oh, wait, I'm in New York. Information is the new uh, gold. And therefore, all of us have to learn about the power of information. I, it's not about big data. It's not about big analytics. It's about big decisions and learning how to do that. And finally, the pace of change has so accelerated that we're finally at the edge of what I really think will become a real-time enterprise. Forget quarters, forget months, forget weeks, forget even daily reports. If you're not doing things in seconds or maybe in minutes, you're missing out on all the real marketing opportunities. And I don't just mean Twitter, put, I mean, sorry, Oreo is putting an ad on Twitter during the Super Bowl, but yes, that is a simple example of the phenomenon. So when I look at those three things, it occurs to me that something has different. There are two colliding forces. Businesses are fundamentally changing and people are taking charge. Businesses are fundamentally changing and people are taking charge. Now I'm gonna personalize this for a moment for me at SAP and then I'll come back to marketing in general. When we looked at that, we started talking about that trend about a year and a half ago, I realized that we could do one of two things. We could give up and roll over and say, somebody is gonna take over the world, or we could use our particular situation. It turns out roughly 65% of the world's transactions go through an SAP system. That's fantastic, thank you for all of you in the room that are SAP customers that helped me do that as well. But if 65% of the people of the world's transaction go through one of our systems, we have a chance to actually improve the world. And so what we did is we made a pretty fundamental shift in our mindset. We said, we're gonna switch from trying to make the best run businesses, which has been our attitude for 10 plus years, to how do we create a better world? And when we shifted that attitude, we said, aha, now we've got a problem. Because our mindset is going from a B2B mindset, how do we improve businesses, to a consumer mindset, a B2C. And some of us were at dinner together last night and I asked the question, is there really any difference between B2B and B2C anymore? And there was a lively debate, so lively that we didn't answer the question after two hours of talking. I personally believe that the difference is evaporating. It's still there now. I don't know if it'll be there in a year or in two, but it's definitely going away. So if you believe that businesses and people are colliding, like I do, it means as marketers that we have to fundamentally think different. And rather than me talk more about this collision, I'm gonna show you how I actually reacted and what I did in order to get the mindset first inside of SAP to change. And then you'll see later this year when we launch our next campaign, how we are actually doing that outside of SAP. And now I'm told there's a rule. If you're a marketing person and you're talking to marketers, you have to show a creative and pretend like it's the best on the planet. So could you roll a video for me, please? Now, regardless of whether you like the creative or not, the point being was actually internal before it was external. It was to get us to rethink of who we are and who we added value to. Because for the previous decade, and many of you have probably seen it as you wander through airports, 
our primary way of marketing was big company name runs SAP. Daimler runs SAP, Colgate runs SAP, maybe sometimes a fun company like Pinkberry runs SAP. Very B2B. Don't know what they do with it, don't know how it helps me, but must be kind of cool because some big company runs them. And we wanted to change the mindset that says it's not about the company because big glass buildings don't buy software. It's about the person. And so as we thought about this some more, it reminded us that we needed a fundamental change. And so the fundamental change, if you're going from B to B to B to C, or frankly, I think from B to C to B to B, but I'll leave others to draw that conclusion, is what we did doesn't work anymore. And we identified three things that we thought the next generation marketer had to have, which wasn't in our DNA. And I'll run through these relatively quickly. The first is they had to think from the point of view of a customer, sorry, I shouldn't say customer, big glass buildings don't buy software, from the point of view of a person rather than the point of view of a product or service. Now we were fantastic, we were one of those companies that could describe our product and service in really compelling terms, but we never emotionally talked to individual consumers. And let me give you a simple example of how that's changed how we work. Dead simple example. Embarrassingly so, so you can uh, make fun of me at the break, and famously inside of SAP in September of 2011, so not so long ago, we ran five events in the same week in New York City within four square blocks. Now how the heck could we have done that? Well, the local sales team put on an event, the local field marketing put on an event, the local channel marketing put on an event, the product marketing team paid a third party to put on an event, and I can no longer remember what the fifth one was. Now that wasn't so bad, except for a senior executive at an unnamed bank that's in this city <laughs> said to me, in the month leading up to those five events on the same week in four square blocks in New York, I got 103 emails from various people within SAP inviting me to that event. And I said, no way, you can't possibly do that. We have rules in our CRM system that says don't spam people. Of course we do. We didn't from within the silo that was product marketing or in the silo that was channel marketing or in the product that was North American field marketing or it was in the silo that was the local sales team. They all obeyed our roles, which is you can't send more than three emails to any one contact during the month. But when you add up all these people that wanted to invite that C-level exec to those five events within four square blocks, we blew it. That's because we thought product and service first rather than consumer first. One simple example of what happens when you have to shift your mindset. The second thing that we realized is we had, and I grew up in this world so I can make fun of it, we had rooms full of people that were product and solution marketing experts. And they spent all their time debating message houses and message trees. And we would argue about whether something was blue or light or thin or fast. And if we always knew if we got the exact right adjectives and adverbs, we could get those messages out and the consumers would beat a path to our door. We were content creators. And of course, we all know that in a social world that makes no sense. We're talking to ourselves. We have invented a new language called Sapanese and we were not actually talking the language of our customers, and I mean consumers. And again, very simple example. When I showed up on the stage, there was a wildly successful product line called Business User Solutions. In fact, I remember a campaign called Get on the Bus, Business User Solutions. And I remember that product, manage, that product team celebrating because at the time, and this is probably three and a half years ago, they were by far the fastest growing solution that ever launched. They went from nothing to I think 400 million in revenue in less than two years. And I asked a simple question, being naive, stupid guy in the audience, I said, what's a business user solution? And they said, well of course you must know, right? We used to only sell to IT, now we sell to business users. I was like, do they think, do they think of themselves as business users or work? And so couldn't get anybody to change it. Turns out these are analytical business intelligence kind of solutions. So we finally, and I had to actually do this at the board level, this is how crazy our Japanese language was. I would ran a really simple experiment. I said, you know, if this is the fastest growing category in, in company history, which it was at the time, it's not any longer, and if, if we are really talking the business user language, then I should be able to look at the keywords that refer people to our website, our flagship one, sap.com, and clearly business user will be in the top 10. Yeah, wasn't in the top 10 wasn't in the top 50, wasn't in the top 100, 
wasn't in the top 500. I no longer remember the exact rank. I used to be able to story. It was 800 and some. What's interesting is not the rank, but the search engine keyword that was exactly above it. It was Boston Tree Sap. <laughs> now, why is Boston Tree Sap above it? Because our office in Boston is on a street with the word tree in it. So that was more likely to drive traffic to our website than the fastest growing product solutions that we ever had. So of course, that was enough to convince the board. OK, you're right. So let's call it what everybody else calls it, which is business intelligence. Nope, we didn't do that either. We didn't do that because when we looked at business intelligence, we noticed something. Now, this was three and a half years ago. It's obvious now. It wasn't obvious then, which is every week and every month, business intelligence was dropping off. And another keyword, analytics, was coming up. Analytics was 30 times less volume than business intelligence, but it was growing. And it was very clear by just doing some simple extrapolation, no fancy math needed, that sometime in the next year and a half, analytics would catch business intelligence. So we called them analytics solutions. And for a change, we started talking the language that people talked rather than the language that we wanted to talk. And finally, what we realized that for the future of marketing, for what we had to do, we had to marry in this case, I think it was a shotgun wedding, the art and the science of marketing. Now, I'm lucky. I work at a technology company. We have wonderful creatives, and we have a great agency we partner with. And I've had for a long time a marketing analytics team, long before I joined, and they do well. The challenge was they don't ever talk to each other. They're not even on the same floor. Some days, they're not even the city. If I were to oversimplify it, all the creative types live in New York, and all the analytics type were in Palo Alto. Not terribly surprising. And so I said, eh, isn't going to work. Everybody has to have a little bit of both. Madur, who sits over there, likes to say one has to have a major and one has to minor. But in some cases, I literally wed them together and said, you guys are going to sit in the same office until you appreciate each other what to do. And they fought like cats and dogs. Hey, it's a real wedding. For about a year. And then now things are much better. And everything we do is now got an analytical side and a creative side as well. And I'll tell a story about that in just a moment. So I don't know about your company, but in my company, once we realized that we had the wrong DNA to be the future of marketing, the very first thing we would have done was hire a bunch of external change agents. Sorry if you're a consulting person in your room. And the second thing we would have done was map out a whole bunch of business processes that need to change. And the third thing we did was stack up technology, because technology is free for me. I've got 3,000 some products in my price category, and put up a dashboard, because we love KPIs at SAP. And I'm an analytics guy by background. And I said, partly because I have a psychological bent, I don't think that's going to work. Let's not make any changes. Let's try to understand what the real barriers to being ready for the future are. Because my fundamental mantra is the culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when we started looking at our culture and our blockers, we identified three that were keeping us from being successful. The first is. We were an activity-driven culture. We celebrated KPIs that talked about how much stuff we did. I call these ego metrics. How many people went to events? How many people went to a trade show? How many people clicked on a, on a, a URL? How many people downloaded a wipe? If it was a pound sign number, we had dashboards full of stuff, and everybody would beat their chest and would run down the hall to tell me or send me an email, I got a 16 million people to do something. Do you know who they are? Nope. What's it going to turn into? Don't know, but it was 16 million. <laughs> Good point. How many was it last week? No idea. So we needed to shift our mindset from tracking activities through ego metrics to outcome-focused impact KPIs. It's hard, very hard, but that's how we now do it. The second thing is we were a cheerful superhero. No matter what our sales team said, we said, fantastic idea. Let's go do it. I'll have it ready to you tomorrow because they were our primary. So we said, no, no, no. Yes, we still have to help our sales team because we're a publicly traded company and quarters matter. But we have this thing called an end buyer. And we're going to spend more time helping the buyer buy than helping our sales people sell. Because it's not our job to cram software down people's mouths. And that, if that means they don't want to get on an airplane and travel to Orlando, where we usually have 15 to 20,000 people at an event, that's cool. We'll bring it to them. And finally, what I inherited was the best field marketing department on the planet, the best advertising marketing planet, the best product marketing, the best who never talk to each other as well. And we said, we got to switch to become marketing. So I banned adjectives. 
somebody said, I'm field marketing. I said, I don't understand that first word. I'm product marketing. No, you're not. You're marketing. And the second thing I did is I said, I don't like our performance system. Wipe out all the KPIs. Everybody in marketing, and I'm blessed to have 1,400 people in marketing, not counting consultants and third parties, are going to share the same five objectives. We call these the pillars. And these are going to stay the same, not for a week, not for a month, not for a year, for at least three years. We're on the second, third year now of these as the pillars as well. We may get to a fourth year and then change them. And everybody cares about the same five. The weighting can be slightly different depending on what your role is, but the same five objectives, and each of these have two KPIs behind them. But then we got worried that these would become the new silos and that people would say, yeah, yeah, I'm not field marketing, I'm the humanize the brand marketing person. So we said, aha, we're going to create pillar shepherds and not pillar owners, and without warning, we're going to shift you. And we did. After the first four or five months, we said, yeah, thanks for helping us figure out what the right thing was to do on invest in people. You're off that, we're going to get some new people. So nobody could get comfortable to living in a silo anymore, because we've mi and we've just mixed it again. And we'll probably won't mix it every three or four months like we used to, because things are starting to settle down, and this is in the DNA. But everybody has to understand everything. They major in some things and minors in other, but they can't close their eyes to anything that's an objective. We'll switch to the next, oh, I'm behind, of course, that's why. So let me just give you two quick examples of what happened. So we love events at SAP. I think we're addicted to them. When I took over as uh, CMO uh, almost exactly two years ago today, we were running 3,500 events a year. 3,500 events in, 11, in 100 countries. Today we're down to about 1,200, which is nice. And the bigger the event, the better. So as an example of the difference between an activity metric and an outcome metric, I'll give you this small case study that happened to one of our major events. If you've been to this event, please don't shout it out. You may recognize yourself, even the audience. So on the left-hand side was a presentation by one of our senior executives that was attended by 250 people and rated 4.7 on a scale of 1 to 5. And that senior executive who demanded a presentation every week and every month Always got a very high level of attendees. 250 is pretty good. You can see it's almost standing room only. And on the right-hand side is a much smaller presentation. In fact, it's a round table from a less senior executive on the same topic, as it turns out, only 10 people there and lower rated. So if you're using traditional, what I call ego metrics, and you run out of room or budget, which one do you kill? The one on the right. Eh, wrong answer. Because we track something else. If you'll click the next slide and a magic red thing will show up. If you click the next, yeah, there you go. Because we track people and what deals we close. And the one on the left-hand side, five deals closed for 20 million euro, but the one on the right-hand side, two deals closed for 70 million euro. So which one's the better event? Which one's the better thing? It's actually the one on the right. Why? Are those 250 attendees? 30 were employees, 40 were partners, another 20 were people that showed up because they thought they wanted to be seen by the senior executive. The actual audience of people that were actually going to do anything is much smaller. I don't remember the number. So the, the moral of the story is if you show up to an SAP event, we're actually waiting and tracking for three months, six months, nine months, a year, 18 months, the likelihood that you are moving the pipeline and close the deal, and that's how we grade our presenters. Not whether you applaud, not whether they're packed, but on the impact it has on our business. Revenue, not top of pipeline. Another example is we do a lot of social media, we do a lot of social listening. It's nice that they call me the social CMO. I'm not sure I really live up to that, and it doesn't mean I'm buying you all drinks. It's not that kind of social. And one of the things that we do all the time is protect the brand campaigns. And I will not go into the gory details of this particular campaign, but late last fall, the CEO of our major rival, whose colors are red, and they're in Northern California, and if you don't know the hit yet, they start with an O, <laughs> said on stage during his major event that we had a problem with a product that we just launched. It wouldn't scale. Now, normally, I don't care. Normally, that's one of those things, whatever, poked in the eye, but a blogger who actually has a tart time job with the New York Times and was just looking at the Twitter feed said, uh-oh, 
Breaking news, SAP has a problem with their new HANA release. It doesn't scale. And because it was a New York Times blogger, then about 30 other bloggers picked it up. And within eight or nine hours, because the keynote was at 8 a.m. and I noticed this when I woke up the next day at 6 a.m., we actually had a number of reports filed that says SAP has a major problem. So what did we do? We used social media as a way to champion it. Because we cultivate an, an entire social media crowd, we actually ran a set the record straight campaign. We didn't attack back. We didn't show up at their major event, which is still running, and put on poster boards and any of that stuff. That's not our style. We basically said, posted one blog, and we said, here are the facts. They say we can't scale, scale over a terabyte. Here's a customer, listen to the video, saying that he is using it at 60 terabytes right now. And what happened? About 3,000 tweets went out in the next 24 hours. 5% of them were from SAP employees. And if you track sentiment, if you look at this detail, we went from positive to neutral on our product to highly negative in under eight hours. It took us three days to recover, but now much more positive than the other guys. How did we know? because we listen to millions of conversations at once. And we track the outcome, not the number of tweets, but the none that didn't come from us. Which brings me, since I promised I'd leave some time, which brings me back to this rocky road that we're at. And what actually is the future of marketing? I think the future is actually here. To steal a quote that's been used by a lot of people, the future has arrived, it's just unevenly distributed. And the challenge that we have is not that we don't know what the future is, it's that we're not sharing very well. When I sit on this road, I don't know that you guys are a quarter mile away on another abandoned road as well. We're, we haven't really built a community market. This is why things like the CMO Club are fantastic, because we are not actually alone, even though it feels like alone. And I think, just like I've tried to break down the silos between my field marketing and my product marketing, and my channel marketing, and my branding, and my advertising, we need to figure out how to break down the silos between marketing departments, between marketing organizations as well. And I think the answer to the future of marketing and how to be better is those three words I started with, although I don't think I said them, is we all need to be smarter, which means we need to realize that information is oil, and whether you call it big data or big decisions, or I don't really care, we need to get much better at making decisions based on what data says. We need to be smarter. We need to become faster. Everything we do takes too long. This is a real world economy. We need to figure out how to get reactionary campaigns in market in sub days, not sub weeks. In some cases, even sub hours. We need to listen and move to a beat that doesn't exist. And finally, we have to be dramatically simpler. I think a secret sauce for a lot of us is to do less. I'm trying to cancel as many things as I do. There are so many things we do pretty well. I'd much rather do a few things extraordinary well. And optimization is my friend. I'm making a smaller number of bigger bets. And I think the future of marketing is all of us, smarter, faster, and simpler. Thank you. So I think we have time for one phenomenal question. Or, or we can talk about on Twitter or all the other places I do as well. No, and. That's an and. <laughs> so who's got the phenomenal question? Anyone, anyone other than Karen? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say anybody other than Karen. That was, Thanks. That was Pete. So one, one of the things, and, and you know, this, while I was at Cisco, we really tried to break down these silos. One of the things that you see almost immediately that hits you in the face is that nobody knows sort of their role anymore. Nobody trusts anyone. You got a whole bunch of people building the entire Toyota car, you know, themselves as opposed to working together. And so, you know, we, we ended up with launch teams like with Unified Communications that had like 2,000 members in the core launch team. Uh, 2,000 in, 2, in the core launch team? 2,000 in the core launch team. How do you get sort of people to understand the, the, you know, their role and you know, that, that subdivision or role and responsibilities when you try to break down silos? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to give you a short, pithy answer since we said it. But 
So first of all, we, we suffer from this disease as well, as you may well, well know. Um, I used to joke that the number one secret of succeeding at SAP was to find the 300 people that wanted to help you when you started a project and make sure they didn't help you. <laughs> it's less true now than it was when I first joined. But um, the, the, I think the answer is we spend less energy on roles and responsibility and more energy on outcomes. We actually say we, we don't like the word own because you don't really own anything at SAP. We like the word lead or shepherd or some word that says your job is to organize everybody and to agree on the objectives you're trying to accomplish. And then what we've done is we've gone from hiring only specialists that were deep to hiring a lot more generalists. We were all specialists, no generalists, and we're probably moving to a 50-50 model. We're not there, we're still probably 70% specialists, 30% generalists, and those generalists become more of the project managers that end up assigning out the tasks, and we move those teams quite frequently. So it's not uncommon for you to be working on a creative campaign for our mobile assets one week, and a set the record straight, we've been attacked by a competitor the next week. But teams of 10, not teams of 2,000 is our rough mantra. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. everybody.